Pasca Sarjana Magister Manajemen Farmasi telah diselenggarakan sejak tahun 1999 sebagai minat Magister Manajemen Farmasi yang merupakan bagian dari program studi Magister Ilmu Farmasi. Pada tahun 2019 berkembang menjadi program studi Magister Manajemen Farmasi. dengan visi menjadi pelopor pendidikan Magister Ilmu Manajemen Farmasi yang terkemuka di kawasan Asia Tenggara dengan dijiwai Pancasila. Dan misi dari program studi Magister Manajemen Farmasi yakni menyelenggarakan pendidikan, penelitian, dan pengabdian kepada masyarakat. Kegiatan pendidikan dilakukan dengan perkuliahan oleh dosen tetap Universitas Gajah Mada yang memiliki kualitas akademik yang tinggi. Kemudian perkuliahan oleh dosen praktisi berpengalaman, kuliah tamu oleh dosen dari perguruan tinggi luar negeri, dan kuliah studi lapangan ataupun mengikuti program internasional. Lulusan Magister Manajemen Farmasi menduduki posisi penting di berbagai bidang pekerjaan kefarmasian, dimulai dari organisasi rumah sakit, badan POM, kementerian kesehatan, industri farmasi, akademisi, lembaga penelitian, apotek, maupun wira usaha di bidang farmasi. Dan tujuan akhir dari program studi Magister Manajemen Farmasi adalah untuk menghasilkan lulusan yang unggul di bidang manajemen farmasi berdasarkan kearifan lokal bangsa Indonesia. Hello uh, everyone, could you please to turn turn off your video first? Uh, we will start to open the webinar. Okay. Uh, good afternoon everyone, uh, Jakarta and Bangkok time. Welcome to the webinar session on the systematic review and meta-analysis in pharmacy practice, a step-by-step guide. It is a honor for me to greet the participants and our two panelists from the Faculty of Pharmacy, Mahidol University, Bangkok, Thailand. Thank you all uh, attendees for your interest in joining us today. We can inform you that our webinar is organized by Pharmacy Management Magister Program, Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Gajah Mada, in collaboration with Faculty of Pharmacy, Mahidol University, Thailand. First and foremost, to ensure everyone has opportunities to gain the most from this webinar session, I would like to remind participants to follow the ground rules here. Let me share screen.
Okay, this is the ground rules. Your microphone will be automatically muted. You will have opportunity to engage our webinar with panelists and each other via online chat. Be respectful for other of other participants and keep your comment on topic and sessions. Submit your question to the panelists in Q&A windows. You may mention the panelist name to address your question. You can use raise hand button to ask question live in the end of session. Do not post any request for technical support in the chat room. Do not provide your feedback about the quality of the session. Uh, but you will be given opportunity to do this by completing a survey at the webinar conclusion. The last, this webinar is recorded and is live streamed on Kanal Pengetahuan Farmasi UGM YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this webinar is will be opened by our dean, Faculty of Pharmacy UGM, Professor Dr. Agung Enjon Nugroho. To Professor Agung, time is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Susi Ari Kristrinya. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semuanya. Good afternoon. Honorable speakers, Associate Professor Dr. Arton Riyupaipon, Honorable speakers, Associate Professor Dr. Montarat Tarfon Charun Sop, Moderator, Committee, Panelists, Attendees, and other participants. Firstly, I would like to say thank you very much to all participants yeah, that attending uh, international webinar systematic review and meta-analysis in pharmacy practice, a step-by-step -step guide hosted by Master Program in Pharmacy Management, Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia, in collaboration with Faculty of Pharmacy, Maidol University, Bangkok, Thailand. Today, we together will, uh, how to say here, uh, how to say webinar that, uh, yeah, Associate Professor Arton will speak about introduction to systematic review in social pharmacy field and also formulate the problem and systematic literature, searching and perform searching technique including reference management software, applying Prisma diagram for study selection. In other side, Associate Professor Dr. Montarat will speak about health management technology assessment graduate program. Yeah, uh, she will speak about systematic reviews and meta-analysis of trials and intervention studies and Taylor's data extraction electronically, critical appraisal of studies, and data synthesis, including narrative and meta-analysis, presenting results and writing the report. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, what is the objective of the event? Yeah, we uh, how to say, uh, so together that uh, in March, yeah, middle of March, our government declares the coronavirus pandemic as a national disaster. After March, yeah, following this uh, policy, uh, universities release policies, yeah, principally to request all staff and students to keep staying at home, yeah, to work from home, teaching, learning from home during the emergency response periods, and also replace all academic activities in campus and classes, including practicum with online activities. And how about uh, the research, yeah? Research of final projects, yeah, best learn for master and uh, how to say, uh, PhD program is recommended using alternative methods. For example, for bachelor program, Research of final project is recommended using a review methods 
For example, narrative review, evidence review, systematic review, or literature study, and survey data collection. Data collection, we can use online searching. For example, from uh, online database, website, internet, and etc. So, review methods, yeah, narrative, evidence, systematic review, are now becoming the most suitable, appropriate, and popular yeah, approach to be a research methodology for students and also for us. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank to all participants. Please enjoy the international webinar. I do wish the event will be fruitful and useful for us, especially during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Thank you very much. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Agung. Your background is very nice, yeah. In Mahidol Salaya Campus, the main campus of Mahidol, make me uh, like a feeling nostalgic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pak Agung. Uh, let me start about the main agenda of our uh, webinar about a systematic review. Uh, maybe we have a question: Why a systematic review is so important? Systematic review, as you know, offer a number of benefits for new researchers. Uh, they can deliver a clear and comprehensive review of valuable evidence of given topic. Moreover, systematic review is also help identify research gap uh, in our current understanding in the field. They can highlight methodological concern as well for a research study, so it will be useful for our master student to start the, their thesis. They can see uh, various methodology involved and that can be used to improve future work in the topic area. Okay, today we will have uh, two distinguished speakers, presenters, who will talk about systematic review in pharmacy field. Uh, the first one, it will be Professor Arton Rupaibun. Sawadika Ajan Arton. Sawadika, Okay. Okay, uh, before start, let me briefly introduce uh, Ajan Arton. Associate Professor Dr. Arton Liu Paibun uh, is an Associate Professor in Division of Social and Administrative Pharmacy, Faculty of Pharmacy, Mahidol University. He received his bachelor degree in pharmacy from Mahidol University. He had worked as pharmacist uh, in the district hospital for three years and office of primary health care for four years before moving to be a university lecturer. Then he received PhD in pharmacy from Curtin University of Technology in Australia. His area is in health economics, focusing on hospital cost analysis, cost of illness study, and economic evaluation. He is a member of administrative committee of graduate program in SEAP, Social Economic Administrative Pharmacy. He developed the standard cost list of Thailand and wrote a chapter of measuring costs in Thai National Health Technology Assessment Guideline. In terms of research and publication, he has published more than 100 papers in international well-recognized journals. He is a member also in editor board of AGDP, International Journal of Pharmacy Practice. Other than teaching, he has gained experience as international consultant for WHO and other organization and working in many countries in Asia and Africa. Uh, he also received high quality research award from International Society of Vaccine. Okay, to uh, Dr. Arton, with special excitement that I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Arton to give a speech uh, around 15 minutes. Please, Ajahn. Thank you very much. Can I share my screen now? Can you, Ajahn? Okay, it's, it's working. Okay, it's working now. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. So I have 15 minutes uh, to cover the contents that uh, Professor Agung already mentioned. So I start uh, with the introduction. Uh, I would like to, uh, <clears throat> to share uh, why we need the statistic review in in case of the, the academic publication, 
if you will export a database like uh, I just test uh, the <coughs> support that we are going to uh, <coughs> review about diabetes. So I search a PubMed with the diabetes terms in the all view mm, just uh, yesterday. So I got uh, 700,000 document mm, that uh, comparing to the previous year, about 50,000 papers increased in one year. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, <clears throat> use the scopus. In the scopus, uh, right now, uh, there are 2.4 million documents. You see how much uh, the documents right now in every year, every time. So among those papers, mm -hmm. uh, they contain a lot of the, the earlier, very wide area, mm -hmm. like uh, the use, even social science, that apply to uh, the pharmacy. Mm. They compose of the various area of the knowledge. Mm. Uh, which one that we want to know, how can we get to that point? In addition to that, among those papers- Excuse me, Ajahn, could you please uh, raise your volume speakers, Ajahn? Okay. Uh, okay. Hello, hello, is it better? Is it better? Yeah, it is better, Ajahn. Okay. Better, better now? Yeah, good. Okay. okay. Uh, among those huge number of papers, uh, we can find some of them is unclear, confusing, or even contradict result to the other studies. This is because uh, right now there are so many uh, publishers that uh, focus on the business, like the open exit that, and also the journal that we have to, uh, to pay for the fee. Those are, we call the PDT publisher that we can buy from the bill list. So we have to be careful to get the data from this paper. And also when we publish the paper and we use the paper for like a graduation, uh, this kind of journal are not accepted by that one. Okay. So especially for the student, we have you have to be very careful to find a journal to publish. And coming, <clears throat> moving to the introduction. So from now on, I use the term pharmacy intervention in the field of the our in in our field of the pharma social pharmacy. Uh, we deal with very really broad area that related to the pharmacy. So I call uh, general term as the pharmacy intervention that include the general, the basic uh, in our area that we call pharmacotherapy, like a drug vaccine, medical products, uh, and also clinical pharmacy services, public health pharmacy, and the pharmacy management. All of this I call pharmacy intervention that we are going to work with. Now moving to the why, how we, we can, uh, we, we, uh, why we have to, uh, to do a review here. Okay. Because uh, we need to <coughs> give the answer of various questions, starting from uh, what pharmacy intervention that is uh, effective or cost effective. In this case, we are going to, to find what kind of intervention uh, that qualify to be the common. Okay. So we have to. to <coughs> to use the evaluation criteria to evaluate the papers and find the paper and find the result from the paper to recommend for the implementation. <clears throat> In addition to, to find the intervention to recommend, okay, if we think that we are going to do something to do the, uh, to conduct a pharmacy intervention, so we need to know the situation of the research in the intervention that uh, we are interested in. In this case, we need to know what kind of intervention that already, what kind of intervention that already implemented, where do they implement, how and when. In this case, we are going to know that which, in what area, in what specific topic that uh, need to conduct another research. Mm. Uh, we should not repeat with the similar, totally similar research to the previous study. So we are going to find a room for our research. 
from the decision analysis of the previous study. When we got the, uh, the area or the topic to conduct the research, we are going to decide uh, the study. So the, the last question that we are going to get from the review, is that we are going to know what appropriate or good research method that we are going to apply or develop from those methods to be our study. These are the question or the benefit of the SIPSIC review. Now moving to the, <coughs> the type of the, the review. Jose Agung already mentioned about the type of the review that it can be narrative okay, review. Okay. It's not long to conduct a narrative review, but uh, comparing to the simplistic review, there is low quality and less reliable, but it's up to the condition. But anyway, the simplistic review can be by ass because uh, normally it because uh, uh, there is no strict method to review. So the review can have a subjective assessment with some by air, try to find a paper uh, leading to the support, their conclusion or their assumption. Okay. That's the relative or traditional review. In contrast to the traditional review, the civic review attempt to do every step systematically starting from the identify the document and evaluate the quality of the, the, the materials or documents mm, relating to the objective that we have set before we start the review. Mm. Based on the study design that we have followed, mm, when we got the result from the review, we can say that the result uh, is reproducible. That means anybody who follow the method that we have done, we will get the same result that we have done. Mm -hmm. So it, transparency, it, it is transparency. So in official definition of the cryptic review, mm -hmm. uh, it is a review with clear formulated question, like a research question. Mm -hmm. After we got the research question, we decide the objective. Then uh, we decide the methods systematically, explicitly to identify, select, and apply the papers. Mm. And after that, analyze the result from the papers mm. <clears throat> uh, to conclude the result for the review. This is the official definition of the civic review. Mm. Now, I'm going to talk about the uh, academic benefit of the civic review. Okay. Right now, synthetic review have a value similar to the other original research article. That means we you can publish the synthetic review. I give you an example of the internal journal of pharmacy practice. In the auto guideline, you can see that the literature review is a one kind of the uh, of the 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 work that you can publish. So the author guideline provides some guide for the uh, author that if you want to publish the uh, the review to the IJPP, okay, your work must be systematic and structured approach. Your work must clearly define the question and objectives of the of the papers, and then uh, this guide the strategy and method and the result mm -hmm. using the quality criteria to assess the paper, mm -hmm. define the reason why you exclude the, uh, the papers from the paper that you search from the database. Mm -hmm. And finally, mm -hmm. it recommended to follow the PISMA guideline when you prepare the report. Okay. This is clear that the, when you work on the artistic review, you can publish and get venue from the, your work. <clears throat> Moving more detail of PISMA guideline, okay. because uh, uh, you normally have to follow the PISMA guideline and when you prepare the manuscript, you should mention that the, your report has followed the PISMA guideline. Okay. The PISMA guideline is a uh, uh, evidence-based minimum set of item for reporting civic review. Okay. 
the guideline focusing on the, the, the experimental uh, research like a RCT. But anyway, you can uh, modify the PISMA guideline to the other kinds of the review. Okay. For more detail, you can go to the, the website. You can see the, the paper that talk about the PISMA guideline. Okay. <clears throat> to be easier to understand, before I'm going to talk about the step-by-step -step of the uh, conducting the cystic review, uh, I show you a case study of a cystic review that, that published in the IJPP. Okay. This paper uh, talk about the uh, uh, development of the community pharmacy-based intervention for people affected by dementia. Okay. In the paper, they describe the problem or the question that why uh, they need to review in this topic. Okay. In the problem or question of the review, it said that, okay, there are many countries that have uh, implemented the pharmacy service management uh, <coughs> to, to help the people with the chronic condition like a hypertension, diabetes. Mm. Uh, this kind of intervention that is by the committee pharmacy. Okay. And then similar to those diseases, mm. dementia is one of the chronic disease that is a problem for the, pe uh, for the people. Mm. And it's interesting that the, the, the committee pharmacy intervention can apply for the dementia as well. Mm. But anyway, uh, they don't know what kind of intervention, and then what kind of the uh, intervention that should, uh, that's uh, appropriate for the, the dementia. So they haven't known yet. So that's why they need to review uh, the previous study that related to this, uh, to the, the dementia in the UK. Okay. And based on the problem, they have defined the objective okay. to identify and evaluate the current research of intervention aimed to the patient that affected by dementia. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the intervention that related to the pharmacy team. Mm -hmm. So it clearly defined the objective that they want to know. Then they define the, the database that are going to use for this review. Normally, uh, we review from the database. Okay. So in this case, they use the MEDLINE, the embed, the signal. This is all of these are uh, database. Okay. But in addition to the database, okay, we can find the document or the report from the other <coughs> source, not only database, like uh, from the website of related organization. And also from the reference from the paper, okay, like uh, we got a paper that related to what we are going to review. And that paper refer to the other work. That means in the reference of many paper that we read, okay, we may find some interesting paper that can be included into our review. This is an, F, this is an example of the, the, the scope and the search term. Okay. This study, they apply the PICO to define the to define the scope of the review, the PICO composed of the population intervention comparator and the outcomes, okay. and for the population, okay, not only the dementia. Okay. Uh, this is based on the clinical knowledge that we 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 need to have when we review for each topic. We have we need to have the basic knowledge on that, <coughs> like uh, in this case, actually. The disease not only use the term dementia, but there are the other terms that like a synonym, uh, synonym or in the same scope of the dementia. So they use term by term uh, to search the paper. Mm. That the group of the population, then the intervention, okay. They use the term community pharmacy uh, in the objective, but when they define the scope of intervention and the search term. It's not just a pharmacist, okay, but uh, 
uh, there are the other terms like a dispenser, technician, counter assistant as well. Mm -hmm. This are the like a similar meaning of the pharmacy intervention. Mm -hmm. And for the competitor and outcome, mm -hmm. uh, they don't know yet and they not specify to which competitor and outcome. That means they include any kind of outcome, any kind of competitor to the pharmacy intervention or uh, sorry, uh, <clears throat> the any kind of competitor that used uh, in the study of the community service in this pharmacy intervention. So they, uh, in that case, they cover everything. So they don't specific to any uh, competitor or outcome. Mm -hmm. And finally, after in each group, they have the term, they, con, uh, they link or update by all one or two or three until 10, that one group. Mm -hmm. And then uh, sum up the group of intervention by the bullying board or as well. That means defensor or pharmacist or technician or the counter assistant. Mm -hmm. And after that link with this, the group of the population and intervention with the word, the Boolean word and, okay. That uh, the searching term that they have designed. Mm -hmm. They also define the session criteria, like uh, the study need to have the minimum 70% of prevalence of the dementia in the study group in that in each study. Okay. The pharmacy team member mm -hmm. uh, need to have the key law in delivering the intervention, the, the study must be, the paper must be the empirical data availability, okay. And the clear intervention in each uh, study. Next, they define session method, okay. The session method composed of the, uh, <coughs> after they, uh, Retrieve the study, okay. They screen the study just based on the title, okay. You don't need to read all the paper, the full paper, every paper. You start reading the title, regarding the same criteria from the title. Some paper is clearly that it's not related or it's beyond the scope of your review. Then you can exclude just based on the title, okay. After that, that means there are some paper that is not clear. Mm -hmm. By reading the title, then you have to need, uh, you have to read the abstract. Okay. The abstract have more detail. And then based on the abstract, you can also exclude the paper that beyond the scope. Mm -hmm. And after that, you have to read the full article. Okay. But again, based on the same criteria, when you read article, you can find some paper that not that beyond the scope of your the same criteria. Then you exclude after reading the full article. Okay. And based on the criteria in some points, okay, it seems to be the, uh, the subjective that the reviewer need to read and assume what is the the, 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 the characteristic of the paper. So in that case, uh, you need to have the reviewer to read to read the papers mm, more than one person. Normally we have two person to review the paper. And in this case, <clears throat> if the result of the, the uh, evaluation of the paper uh, is come to be discrepancy, that means uh, might be some paper that one reviewer say yes, the other say no. Yeah. So in this case, both reviewer have to be discussed to get the finalized uh, answer to include or not include that paper. Then we have to extract the data from the paper. So in this case, it's like a, uh, you conduct a survey research. In the survey research, you collect the data from the patient or from the villagers. Okay, you do interview based on the questionnaire and you, uh, you get the, 
data information from the patient or liver uh, based on the questionnaire. Similar to a survey research, when you review the article, one paper is similar to one patient that you, you have to get the data from the paper. How to get the data is similar to interview. You need to have the questionnaire or the data, extension, data collection form. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you need to decide the, the data extraction form, and then you collect the data, collect the data for, uh, by reading the article, and you fill in the data extraction form. Yeah. This is an example mm -hmm. of the data collection form. Okay. You decide and you have to record and you can you have to keep uh, this form. Mm -hmm. So it's like a good the questionnaire when you conduct a survey research, you have to keep questionnaire at the evidence. Okay. Uh, you can show to anyone that uh, would like to check uh, the result of the, uh, the of the research. And the next step is the quality assessment of the paper. Okay. In this case, uh, it's up to the the uh, the character the the type of the review. Okay. If you uh, just to know the situation of the research, okay, you just uh, decide the point that you want to know, and you check it like a quality assessment and you check what is the quality of the study um, based on the checklist of the quality criteria. And you include all articles into the uh, report. Okay. But in case that you want to review to get <clears throat> the answer from the review, for example, uh, you want to, uh, uh, to get the, the result for the uh, economic evaluation when you conduct the modeling. You want to uh, know the cost of the disease, cost of the treatment to use in the review, to use in the economic evaluation modeling. Okay. In that case, <coughs> you have to assess the paper with the good quality and you get the number uh, of, the, of the treatment cost from only good study. Okay. For the not qualified study, you, you, you don't include into the review. Okay. You use the quality assessment, mm -hmm. uh, but after you assess the paper, you report on the paper based on the quality assessment. Mm -hmm. That for the situation analysis uh, of the quality of the study in that area. But if you want to get the result to you the, the, in the next step, you just include only the Qualify paper into the result. This is also important. Moving to the part of the result, okay. uh, you have to show that how can you get the paper include, included into the review by the diagram, starting from uh, the database that you uh, search. Mm -hmm and how many paper based on the search term that you use in each database. Okay, how many paper that you have, how, may, how many paper that you collect from the gay area, like uh, from the, uh, the, the website, something like this. Okay. And after that, you check the duplicate. Mm -hmm. uh, I show you later that when you use many database, there are some uh, duplicate. Okay, you have to check the duplicate and uh, echo the duplicate. Okay. And after that, uh, based on the same criteria, step by step from the title, abstract, and the full uh, article, then you echo it. And then finally, in this study, finally, uh, from the more than 1,000 papers, okay, finally, it just only 29 papers that meet the criteria to be the review, to be review. <clears throat> and after you get the paper, you extract 
uh, the data from the paper based on the form that you design. Right? Then you produce the result from the review. Normally starting with the study characteristic of each paper. And after that, you have to answer uh, uh, what you want to know based on the objective that you have decided, point by point, okay, like this. Mm -hmm. Finally, the discussion, similar to the other kind of research, okay, you need to give the discussion. Okay. And also similar to the other kind of research for the discussion, there are two main parts of the discussion. Okay. The first part of the discussion based on the objective that you want to know, okay, how can you get the answer based on the objective? The answer is either reliable or not reliable, different or similar to the other study. Okay. This is based on the, the answer of the objective. And in addition to the, the answer to the objective, so you have to discuss how good or strength and weakness of your study. Okay. <clears throat> that based on the method of the review. Okay. What is the strength of your review method? What is the weak point or limitation of your review? Okay. You have to clearly define to be transparent, then the leader can uh, judge that, okay, how, how is the benefit of your study of your review? And how can, how much uh, they can apply the result from our study. We are uh, transparency declare. Okay, that an example of the review from the uh, published article. Okay. Now I'm moving to the step that when we, when uh, you are going to conduct a statistic review. So it's similar to any kind of research, you have to decide the protocol or the proposal. And the format of the protocol is also similar, in general, similar to other kind of the, the research. Starting from the background or introduction that define the situation and the problem or uh, research question. Related to the research question, you decide the objectives. And after that, the methods, starting from the database. Okay. What kind of database that uh, appropriate for your review uh, that related to the, con, uh, the, the, the area of your review because uh, there are many database mm, and each database, they have the scope of the uh, article that included in the database. So you have to define what, kind, what database that you, you are going to include in your review. And then uh, decide the, uh, Selecting criteria of the study, uh, data action method, guidelines of the action, and also the form you use to extract the data from the papers, the article. And after that, uh, in the topic of the results, okay, you have to show the secret document, like uh, the three diagram that in the previous paper and how to uh, synthesis it and how to decide the summary table of the result from the review and then the discussion conclusion. This is the, uh, the protocol. You must decide the protocol before you start the review, similar to the other kind of research. I, I like to say something about the objectives. Okay. Many students put the objective that to review the study on that, 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 mm, that should not. Mm. We know that you are going to review because of this is specific review. You don't need to mention in the objective that uh, the purpose is to review. Okay. But you have to define clearly what you want to know on the review, okay. Like uh, to explore the situation of the study on that, 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 that to evaluate the quality or to, uh, to define the, uh, to explore the method of the study, to explore the effectiveness, to explore the cost effectiveness of that, 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 okay. 
clearly state what you want to know from the review. Okay, not just to review. Okay. Moving to, to the database. Okay, we are familiar with PubMed. Okay, because it's free uh, database. Anyone can access the PubMed. Okay. And at Maidon, we uh, have uh, subscribe many database. Okay. So we can access to like a Scopus. Okay. <coughs> Scopus, you have to, to pay um, for the subscription. Um, uh, otherwise, you cannot access the Scopus. Uh, the other is side dialect for the base for the dissertation and GC. This is also uh, useful because uh, uh, in many countries or many universities, they don't require publication for graduation uh, credit study. Okay, in that case, there are many good research in the form of the GC, but uh, many people don't know, cannot access because it's not published in the article and include in the database. So if you want to have a good review, you may also go to the this database that include the TCG. And in more detail, more specific, with the Crocken collaboration, with the CRD here from the York University in UK, also have the database. A little bit more about the PubMed. Okay, the PubMed is very good uh, <coughs> database because uh, uh, although it, uh, it started in 1996, but uh, they include the data, okay? They include the data from the MedLine PMC and the MedLine is very old database because the MedLine uh, started in 1960, but include the data back since 1946. So the PubMed is very good, very really broad uh, database, include the, uh, <coughs> man, uh, the, the, the broad area of the knowledge in the life science. Okay. And for the PubMed, the PubMed uh, is a uh, database that uh, uh, include a full article. But anyway, uh, just to show you that, okay, the PubMed include the MedLine and the PMC. So that means you don't need to go uh, to this and this because uh, when you go to the PubMed, it already include uh, the MedLine and PubMed already. For the Scopus, <coughs> it's a large international multidisciplinary database. Okay. Uh, it said that the Scopus, the cover 100% of MedLine. Okay. And uh, uh, the PubMed also include the, the MedLine. Okay, that means they are overlapping between the support and the public. But anyway, there are many journals that uh, uh, included in the support, but not in the PubMed. Okay, so you can get some, you can get benefit from using the support to access some article of the journal that not included, not indexed in the PubMed. And also uh, more database. Okay, you can you can see later because it's not uh, widely used. Okay. Now, when we conduct uh, uh, the uh, search from the searching from the database, so I show you how different uh, the PubMed and Scopus. Okay, give you some evidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, I use my case at a case study. I searched the paper of myself using the PubMed and Scopus. Okay. The PubMed, I got 49 items. Scopus, I got 74 items. Okay. This is show you that uh, just 39 papers that overlapping between Scopus and PubMed. And then 10 papers not available in the Scopus, just only in the PubMed. Okay. And 39 pap 30, uh, 39, 35 papers already uh, only available in the Scopus, not in the PubMed. Okay. Then now you can see that why we need to uh, search more than one database. So at least Scopus and PubMed. Okay. As I told you that uh, uh, <clears throat> some 
article that not available from the other database that related to the journal mm -hmm. that index into Scopus or PubMed. Mm -hmm. For example, our journal here at Mahidon, we have the farm size Asia. Right now, it only Scopus index, but not PubMed index. Uh, in that case, when you publish to farm size Asia, so you cannot search, you cannot find in the PubMed, but must be Scopus. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about the PICO that mentioned earlier in the in the, uh, the paper that I show you as an example. Okay. Uh, the PICO is a technique to define the scope of searching. Mm -hmm. uh, they decide focusing on the clinical question in the clinical trial. Okay. Uh, but we can apply okay, uh, for the other kind of the research as well. Okay. This is an example of the PICO. PICO uh, P defined for the population, I is intervention, C computer or outcome. So it gives you easier example, like uh, we are going to review cost effectiveness analysis of the pharmacy counseling in committee for diabetic patients. Okay. Now we define the scope. Mm -hmm. What kind of diabetic patient that we are going to include? Okay, in this case, we include all page, all age patients, mm -hmm. not just elderly. Okay, you have to make it clear the population, all patient or just the specific age group mm -hmm. for the patient. And intervention is home health care, the counseling. The C is the clinical bed, completer is clinical bed, the counseling, like uh, you provide the counseling at the pharmacy department compelling that you visit patient at home and provide counseling. Okay. And the outcome is the cost and effectiveness or the quality gains or the answer at the outcome of the study. Based on the scope, you have to decide the search term like uh, for the patient with all age, you, you can just use the diabetes with the uh, white card here. Okay. So uh, it cover diabetes or diabetic Okay, it, uh, it is easier to just use the term diabetes with a white card, or you can use the mesh term, mm. <clears throat> mesh term that I'm going to talk later in the PubMed. They have the mesh term or the group of the uh, of the area uh, that include diabetics, uh, that include the DM in the mesh term. Mm. Another group mm, is about the intervention. Mm and comparator, okay? Uh, you think about the counseling, you think you can use the, the term counsel with a white card. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to link with the, the hospital or clinic or community or home. And this is an, an, just an example uh, to define the intervention and counseling, the, uh, the comparator here. And then the outcomes here. Uh, we are going to measure the outcome in terms of cost effectiveness. So you can use the term cost and effective or quality, or you can use the measure term to cover cost effectiveness analysis. Okay. <clears throat> uh, when you use the when you use the search term. You can specify the third term in the title or the title abstract. In case your study is not the, uh, the experimental study, okay, it not fit to use the PICO, okay, but you can apply uh, the PIC, mm -hmm. PICO, but the small o here. Mm -hmm. uh, the this modify PICO, the, the CO, it for the context. Okay. Again, show you an example, like uh, you want to uh, review the cause of diabetic complication in Asian countries. Okay. Based on your, uh, your title like this, you define the scope, uh, P, the population, mm -hmm. diabetic patient or age with complication. 
that the population. I uh, that you want to know it cost of units and the context is Asian countries. So one by one, you have to define the search term. Okay. Diabetic patient, you use this term. And then for the the I okay, you use the cost or economics or finance or expenditure or use the mesh term. And the context, you have to divide country by country in the Asian country, linked by all Brunei or Cambodia. I suggest to you the Y part in the country as well. Because uh, uh, the term that used in the paper, it can be the study in Indonesia, okay, or study among Indonesian patients. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it can be Indonesia or Indonesian. Then uh, it's easier to use the Y card to cover both Indonesia and Indonesian or Thai people and Thailand when we put the white card like this. <clears throat> Moving to the, the mesh term. The mesh term is a medical subject heading. It's a technique to make a grouping of the paper in the same area or the same topic together. Yeah. It can be useful, but uh, you have to be careful to use the mesh term as well. Okay, I, I can skip the technique uh, because the time limit of uh, limitation. Okay. I forgot on the point of the mesh term, like uh, when you use the mesh term cost of units, okay, you can see that uh, under the cost of units, it cover the term, this term, we call the entry term. In the cost, the cost of signet burden of needs net, all of this, uh, the paper with all of this term uh, are included under the group of the mesh term of the cost of unit. And you can see in the mesh term, when you, you search, you can see that the, the hierarchy of the term that they use. In this case, you see that the cost of unit here is under the, the, of the cost and cost analysis. I show you how to apply the mesh term and why I told you that you have to be careful when you use the mesh term. Okay. Uh, again, I do experiment. Okay. I have conduct many papers, some paper about the diabetes cause of the DM in Thailand. Okay. I know that all of my paper are the cause of unit study. Okay. First, I use the search term in the title by using the, the term cost with the Y card here. Okay. Based on uh, searching using the title in a few of the title, I got the five papers. Again, I compare to using the mesh term cost of units. I got only two papers when use this uh, mesh term. And then I, I try the broader mesh term that I show I show you before that. Uh, before the cost of unit, there is a term cost and cost analysis. It's a broader term that cover the cost of units. When I use the cost and cost analysis mesh term, I got the five papers, same as using the search term here. Okay. This is the evidence that you have to be careful that I already know that all of my paper is the cost of units. Mm -hmm. But I don't know because of, uh, there are some limitation of the people who define the paper into the mesh term. Okay, they don't define the first three papers under the cost of unit. Okay, uh, okay. Now moving to the a little bit about how to use the reference software uh, to help the civic review. Okay, basically, 
you need to buy the duplicate. Okay, you should not read manually paper by paper to see if the repeat for the previous or not because uh, you are going to got uh, uh, several thousand papers from different database. Okay, a lot of duplication. Okay, uh, here at my don we use the end note. Mm. The end note, I think uh, any kind of the reference uh, management software can do the duplicate. Okay. In this case, for the for the uh, the end note, when you when we uh, review the we got the paper from the database and then we import to we import to the the end note library. Okay. Uh, we can uh, use the function uh, discard duplicate. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the paper that already in the uh, previous search and import into the end node already, when we in the second import, if it repeat to the uh, the already in the library or in the file, so they exclude. So we know how many papers that duplicate they show. So we have to take a note that how many papers that duplicate because we have to report number of duplicates. The second point of the benefit of the using the end node, okay, we can uh, make a group of our paper. Okay, Ap after we uh, put our article into the the end node, so we have to uh, check and exclude. Okay, at first we can read the title and exclude. Okay, in this case. Okay, we can make a group. Okay, on the left side here, we can make a group like a, uh, as an example, uh, I create a group to be exclude mm -hmm. based on the title, based on the abstract, based on full paper. Mm -hmm. After we check the title, mm -hmm. and when we drag to the group here, okay, drag to each group, and then the number of the paper in each group show here. So we can use this in the report because uh, when we report the review, we have to report that how many papers that we accrued based on what reason. So we then we can get the number from this one, from the grouping here uh, to put in the report. Okay, I think I, I, I have done a good job because the time uh, I can finish in time now. In conclusion, when we conduct a synthetic review, okay, the using mesh term, it can be useful in case that uh, in that area, there are so many uh, terms like uh, you want to know about the health promotion. So many kind of health promotion you have to use the term exercise or walking or running or, or, or so many or, and sometimes you don't know uh, very well in that area. Okay. So in this case, the, the mesh term that is the group of that area uh, can be useful like a, instead of using the, the, uh, the exercise or running or, 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 or you just use the mesh term to cover the board area. Okay. That's the benefit of the mesh term. But the mesh term can be early as I show you. You have to be careful and, and try the, the various level of the mesh term in your, in your search. Mm -hmm. But this is up to that. Uh, uh, if you use the broad term, you got uh, many paper that not related to what you want to know. You have to exclude a lot. You have to put a lot of energy to read and to exclude. But if you use the very narrow, Mesh term, you can miss some paper. Okay, that that the point to be considered. And you can use the search term in the view of the title of abstract as well. If you know very well, uh, the term that usually used in that area, it's better to to use the term in the title and abstract view. Uh, but if possible, you can use both searching by mesh term and searching by using the search term or keyword in the title and field and the abstract field. Mm -hmm. And you have to 
use more than one database, not just only PubMed. Okay. In case that you can access, okay, I don't know uh, how many databases that you can access. Uh, when you, I, I, I'm sure that uh, Kajamada can provide more than, uh, uh, you can access more than the public, okay. In that case, you, uh, you need to search for more than, not just the public, okay. I think that's it for the overview of the uh, septic review uh, that I can talk in 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Acar Arton, for a very nice uh, topics uh, presentation, explanation about the brief of a uh, systematic review to practical uh, experience uh, that Acar Arton have, and lesson learned that, that we have to uh, consider when we uh, search uh, the the term. And uh, okay, thank you very much, and we turn to second. Uh, panelists, uh, we will have say uh, share screen room. Okay, our second speakers, uh, Associate Professor Professor Dr. Montarata von Charunsap. I usually call her Achan Mon. Yeah. Uh, Achan Mon holds a PhD in Social and Administrative Pharmacy from Department of Pharmaceutical Care and Health, Policy, Health System, uh, College of Pharmacy, University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, USA. She completed her bachelor degree in pharmacy at Mahido University, Thailand. And uh, during around six years from 2006, she was appointed as consultant from HTA, Health Technology Assessment Program at Ministry of Public Health in Thailand. She also uh, has published many research in uh, the field of pharmacoepidemiology, outcome research, uh, cause of illness, willingness to pay, heart quality of life, and HTA itself. She also received several fellowship and award, uh, such as the Royal Golden Jubilee PhD program, Thailand Research Fund, the Melendi Dissertation Fellowship, College of Pharmacy, Minnesota University, USA, scholarship of Royal Thai Government, and first center award uh, as the overall academic performance from Faculty of Pharmacy, Mahidol University, Thailand. Okay, to Achan Mon. Hello, Achan Mon. Okay. 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 Uh, please, Ajan, uh, give uh, your lecture about uh, 50 minutes, and after that, we will have a discussion later on. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dr. Susi, for a very nice introduction. Okay. Let me share my slide. Have you saw my slide? Yeah, Ajan, it's work. Okay. Okay. Let me see. Okay. 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 Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, organizing committee at the University of Kajamada for organizing this uh, interesting webinar and also inviting me to join this webinar. It is quite an, a new experience for me as well. Uh, and thank you very much. It's a, a great honor to join. So, okay, let's start. Um, I was assigned to talk about um, like five topics. The first one is like a systematic review and meta-analysis of trials and intervention studies, and then how to tailor the data extraction electronically, and then the clinical press of studies, data synthesis, and then presenting results and writing up the report. Okay, so many topics. Uh, and I was assigned 15 minutes, so it won't be, I won't uh, talk about the concept, but don't uh, go into the detail then. Okay, let's talk about, um, let I remind you about the level of evidence. Um, this pyramid show the level of evidence from low to high level of evidence. And you can see that systematic review and meta-analysis of the RCT 
rank the highest on the level of evidence. So it's the, the evidence that people trust the most. So you can see that it is very important to, I mean, the systematic review and meta-analysis of the RCT. Um, this slide show the steps of how to conduct a meta-analysis. Um, I think Ajahnathan already covered the first two uh, steps. The first step is formulating the review questions and the developing the protocol of the systematic review that Ajahnathan already mentioned about that in, in the previous sections. And the second step, once you developing the protocol, you will start by searching and selecting the studies. Ajahnathan already mentioned about how to search the uh, uh, the database because this is a systematic review the key point is that you have to search uh, you have to do a comprehensive search so you search more than one database not only the PubMed you can search Embase as well Scopus as well and the other databases as well and you also need to identify the unpublished studies and you need to have a very effective searching strategy in order to identify um, the study that met the, that that you really like that should be included in the review, and then once you search the study, you have to select the studies, and you will do this by uh, setting up the eligibility criteria like P code P is a patient, I is the intervention, C is the comparator, and O is the outcome. And some people also add S as a study size as well, and then. Once you search a study, you selecting the study, then let's go to the third step, which I will cover in this section. Uh, the, the third step is do a study quality assessment. You have to do, you have to assess the quality of individual study that included in your review. And I will tell you why later on in, in, the, in these sections. And the other step after the study quality assessment is the act data extraction from each individual studies. And then the last step is the data analysis and interpretation. So I will cover the, the last three steps of the meta-analysis step. Um, let me talk about the data extraction first. In order to extract the data, you have to design your data extraction form. And also you have to pilot your data extraction form that you develop that whether it is work well or not. And when you do data extraction, uh, you have to do it by one more than one person and do it independently. What I mean is that once you uh, I include like 30 articles into your review, and when you have to extract the data from these 30 articles, you have to have at least two of you and at least of you extract the data from each study and then you compare together. And if there is any discrepancy, you have to discuss among both of you. And if you can resolve the discrepancy, that is okay. But if both of you cannot uh, resolve the, the discrepancy, you have to, you might need a third person's and when you extract the data, these are the information that you need to extract. The first one is the bibliographic detail. I mean, like um, a study title, um, a journal information, an author, something like that. This is the bibliographic details. And then you have to extract the study characteristic. What I mean by Study characteristic is like study design and method, whether it is RCT, it is cohort, it is case control, or other design. And then you also need to extract the characteristic of participants, including the number of participants in each group, the intervention group, the control groups, or the case and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the control groups. And then like percent male, mean age, a stage of diseases. These are general characteristics of the participant that you may need to extract. And then the third thing about the study characteristic that you need to extract 
is intervention. You need to extract what are the intervention that you interested and or you also need to extract the dose of the, the intervention and also the route of administration is IV or oral or IM or something like that. And then the, the detail about the comparison. What are the comparison that you compare right now? It is placebo, it is other drugs and what are the doses form and what are the at the root of the administration. And also the outcome measure uh, that you interested in comparing. For example, you want to compare C-reactive protein, you want to compare the number of serious ADR, you want to compare the blood pressure, or you want to compare the incident of CHD related mortality. So these are the thing that uh, the think about the outcome measure that you want to compare. And the third item that you need to extract from each individual studies are study results, which is very important. The study result can be classified into two types based on the types of the outcome that you're interested. It can be continuous outcome. For example, like uh, you want to compare the level of blood pressure in millimeter mercury, this is like continuous outcome. If the outcome that you're interested is continuous outcome, you have to extract the mean and the SD or the SE of that outcome. But if the outcome that you're interested is the autonomous outcome, for example, death or alive, um, having ADR or not having ADR, having stroke or not having stroke, achieve goal or not achieve goal. These are examples of dichotomous outcome. If the outcome that you're interested are dichotomous outcomes, you have to extract the number of participants in each group and also then the number of events that occur in each group. You don't need to extract the relative risk. You don't need to extract the odd ratio or the 95% confidence interval. All you need is like number of participant and number of event in each group. And the last thing that you need to extract from each study is a study quality assessment. You have to design the data extraction form that incorporate how you assess the study quality. Let me show you an example of data extraction form. Um, Right now, when you decide a data extraction form, you will design it electronically, or it means that you will you will not use that pencil and uh, paper. You will use it in Excel sheet, Excel worksheet. And many of the people thought that once you key in the data into the Excel worksheet, this is mean uh, electronic data extraction form, but it's not quite like. Uh, like that, I will show you this example. The first example is like when you want to compare the intervention group and the control groups. Um, the outcome that you want to compare, we have two main outcomes that you want to compare between intervention and control. The first outcome that you want to compare is the mean C-reactive protein. And the second outcome that you want to compare between these two groups are the incident of ADR. Suppose that you extract, decide a data extraction form with, uh, based on these examples. So the first column is the detail about the study. So you extract the name of the author and the years of the published uh, study. And the second column, you extract the countries or the setting of the study. And the third column is the duration of the intervention, how long you give the drug to the participants. It can be like two months, five days, and eight weeks. And then we talk about the intervention on uh, a detail about the intervention groups. So NI, the capital NI means the number in the intervention group. The sample size in the intervention group which can be 30, 101, and 60 in each studies. And then the second column in the intervention group is the detail about uh, mean C-reactive protein and the SD. So it will be mean plus and minus the SD of the C-reactive protein. And then 
um, the incident of ADR, which is occurred 3.3% in the first study, 2% in the second study, and 10% in the last studies. And then move on to the data extraction form for the control groups. NC stand for the number in, in the control group. This is the sample size in the control groups, which is 30, 260. And again, this is the mean C, mean and plus and minus uh, SD of C reactive protein for each individual study. And uh, the last one is the percentage of the people who develop uh, the ADR. So if many people thought that this is the right way to do the data extraction form in the Excel, so many people use the Excel file and then extract the data like this in the Excel file. What do you think? Is this the right way? And th is this called um, doing the data extraction form electronically? Uh, let me show you by compare with another example though. So remember this example. And these are another design. The same questions, but you decide differently. The first column is still study name and the year of publish. And then the country, now you not type in the name of the country, but you design the code for each country. For example, Chile is one, India is two, and then US is three. So you define the code and then you key in the number. And duration, now we change the duration in two days. In the unit is day. So the first one is 60 day, and this is five day, and this is eight day. If you compare to the previous study, you type in two months, five days, and eight weeks, which are different units, right? And then the green column stands for the information in the intervention groups. The same NI is the total sample size in the intervention groups. And the mean and the SD now, you can see that the mean and the SD now are in different column. So this is the mean of the C-reactive protein in the uh, intervention group. And this column stands for the SD in the column, in the intervention group. And now you can see the last column of the intervention, we call it NI, which is the number of event in the intervention groups. So we said that uh, this is the number of event that we interested in now is the number of patients who are developing the serious ADR. So based on the total 30 subjects, only one subject developed the ADR here. And two subjects out of 101 developed the ADR. And six out of 60 subjects developed the ADR. So you can see that uh, it is different from the previous data extraction form, right? And the further control is the same. My NC stands for the num total number in the control group. This is the mean C reactive protein in the control. This is the SD of C reactive protein in the control group. And this is the number of people who develop ADR in the control groups. You can see that there are differences between the example one and example two. So most of the people thought that this is example one. If you do it, if you do the example one in the Excel file, this is mean that do doing the data extraction electronically, but it is not. <laughs> Let me show you what do you think? is the most appropriate data extraction form when you decide it electronically in the Excel file. Example one or example two? Because I can't hear your answer, so I will give you the answers. So the right way to do the data extraction form electronically in the Excel file is example two, not example one, okay? You have to design you can see that you have to decide the code for each country. You will not type in all the text in each column and you have to extract mean and SD separately. And then you don't need to extract the percentage of people who 
have the event, but you have to extract number of people who develop event and also the total number of event, as I mentioned previously. That if the study result is dichotomous, you have to extract the number of participants in each group and number of events that occur in each group. You will not, you don't need to extract the percentage. So the right example is example two, not example one. And let me give you the tips of doing the data extraction. First, you have to, when you extract the data, you need to highlight the extracted data on the original study. So when you have, when you, when you are answer, when your data is not consistent with your uh, friend who doing the data extraction form, and you have to go back and check your data extraction, you will do it easily if you highlight the data that you extract on the original studies. And then you also have to document all your calculation and estimate. If you do any estimate, do it in Excel spreadsheet using the formula and save it. And extract data in the Excel spread spreadsheet and decide the data extraction form as the example tool that you design the code or something like that. And one cell, you type in only one number. It will be ready for analysis. If you if one cell you type in so many detail like mean plus and minus SD, you cannot do analysis. So you have to do one cell and one number. So it will be easier to conduct the analysis. So these are the tips of doing the data extraction form. And next, I will move on to talking about the study quality assessment. As uh, when you're conducting the systematic review, you didn't conduct a new study, but you summarize the individual study that other people conducted. There are many people who conduct a, a study and then you summarize them all. So there is a term, uh, um, a very popular quote called garbage in, garbage out. If you got garbage, it means that the quality of each individual study are very low. They are not good. They are not valid. And then you summarize them or you combine them together. You, uh, your meta-analysis or systematic review will not be in a good quality. It's like garbage in, garbage out. If the study of, of each, uh, suppose that each individual study have very really low quality, it's not valid. When you combine them all by using the systematic review meta-analysis, your meta-analysis is not reliable or not valid. So it's like garbage in, garbage out. That is why you have to assess the quality of each individual studies. And once you assess the quality of individual study, you found out that some study is in good quality and that it should be valid conclusion. Some study is not good. Once you assess the study quality, some people do like you only summarize or only include the study that have high quality in your review. Or some people do like uh, sensitivity analysis, like when you combine all individual study without, uh, um, uh, by not taking into account the quality, you combine them all first. And then the other idea is that you combine only the good quality study, and then you compare. This is like subgroup analysis by a study quality. And when you assess the study quality of the RCT, again, like similar to the data extraction form, you have to assess the study quality by more than one observer. So like two of you assess the study quality and then you compare if there are any discrepancies you have to discuss. And if you cannot resolve the, the discrepancy, you might need the third people, a third persons to finalize. And when you assess a study quality in RCT, there are many instruments that you can use to assess a quality of RCT. But this instrument always like talking about uh, 
randomization, blinding, and handling of patient attritions. And when you, another thing that you need to consider when you assess a study quality, you might blind the observer to the name of the author, to the name of the journal, because if you know that, oh, this study published in JAMA, this study published in Lancet or BMJ, or this study published by a very, very expert, you might be biased that, that this, this study is in high quality. So it's con you consider binding of the observer to authors, institutions, and journals. There are many, as I mentioned, there are many instruments that you can use to assess a, a quality of RCT. For example, JADAS score, how can risk of bias choose? There are other uh, instruments as well, but these two are very common. I will talk a bit about uh, the JADAS and Cochrane risk of bias too. The first uh, instrument is JADAS score. It is popular because it's very short. It is like uh, a five point scale. Uh, you have only five points and uh, it assesses the quality of RCT using only three criteria. The first criteria is related to the randomization. The second one is related to the double blinding. And the third one is uh, focusing on the withdrawal and dropouts. And if you use that, that score, the score will range from zero to five. And the score, which is um, higher or which is at least three indicate the high quality of the studies. So let um, talking into detail about the JADAT score. So as I mentioned, the JADAT score consists of three criteria. The first one is randomization. The second one is blinding. And the third one is um, the withdrawal and dropout. For the, the randomizations, uh, you can see that the, uh, the possible score ran from zero to two. The, the question is that, was the study described as the randomized? This means that whether they have a term like randomly, randomly assigned randomization. If it just described that this is randomization study, you got one. If it didn't mention that it is randomization study, it got zero. And then if it if the study described the method to generate the sequence of randomization and the method that they use is appropriate, they got another one point. But if they didn't mention any method used to generate the sequence of randomization, they just got zero point on this. However, if the study mentioned about the method to generate the sequence of randomization, but it was inappropriate, now it will got minus one. So these two points mean that if you tell the method to generate the sequence and it appropriate, you got plus one point. But if you tell the method, but it is inappropriate, you got minus one. But if you didn't tell any method, you got zero point here. And then let's move on to another um, criteria, which are blinding. The same as randomization, if uh, the study said that this is a double bias study, you got one point. But if it didn't say anything, you got zero point. And then if the study described the method, how they're doing the double blind, and the method that they used to do double blinding was appropriate, you got plus one point. But if you describe the method of doing the double blinding and it is not appropriate, you got minus one point. But if you didn't say, say about the method of doing the bun bar, you just got zero point here. Okay. And then the last criteria talking about the withdrawal and dropout. Uh, is there any description about withdrawal and dropout? If they explain how many people drop out and uh, in each group and the reason why they drop out, you got plus one. But if you didn't say anything, how many people drop out and why they drop out, you got zero. So this is um, a, an example of JADAS score. This is the detail of uh, 
each criteria, for example, the randomization, when I said that if this uh, describe the method to generate the sequence of randomization, and if it appropriate, you got plus one. What is the, these are example of appropriate randomization sequence, right? They said that they're using random number, yes, using a computer generating. This is appropriate method to generate sequence of randomization. But uh, if they say that they use death of birth, death of admission or hospital number as the way to generate the sequence of randomization, these are example of inappropriate method. If they describe like this, they would got minus one point. And these are the criteria, uh, the, the detail of the second criteria, which is binding. As I mentioned previously, if the, the study described the method of doing the double blind, and if it appropriate, you got plus one. And these are examples of appropriate way to do double blinding. So it should say that neither person doing the assessment nor the study participant could identify the intervention being assessed. Uh, or they said that they use uh, identical placebo or dummy that look like the, the active drug or something like that. If they say something or describe something like that, this means appropriate. And inappropriate means you said you're doing the double buy, but you compare tablet versus the injection without no double dummy. These are examples of not appropriate double binding because people can still guess that they are on which drug or which interventions. If the study explained the method of doing the double buy and it is not appropriate, they got minus one point here. And this slide shows the detail of the third criteria, withdrawal and dropout. It means that if the people, uh, it has to describe how many people are not included in analysis, like the number of people who drop out along with the reason that they withdraw or drop, drop out. If there were no withdrawal, it should state in the article that there were no withdrawal. If they didn't say anything, they got zero point. If there is no such, uh, this is what I mean. This, if they didn't say anything about withdrawal, they, they we got zero point here. And keep in mind there are some uh, limitation of the JADAT score based on this criteria. If you just say the number and the reason that they drop out, you got one point, no matter how large, uh, how many people drop out. For example, if like half of the people drop out, you still got one point because you describe how many people drop out. So these are a, a limitation of the JADAT score that it didn't take into account the number of people who, who withdraw. Okay. So these are the critique of the data score. People thought that it gave more weight to the quality of reporting than to the actual methodological quality. For example, if, you doing, if you're not doing a good randomization and you didn't say anything, you didn't, you got zero point. But if you say, and it is not good, you got minus one. So it's like you care about the quality of reporting than the actual quality. Like I mentioned previously in the drop out and withdrawal. If you just say that how many people drop out and the reason you got one point, no matter how large people out. In fact, like if the many people like more than 20% or 30% drop out, this is not good. And the data score is also received a critique on that it give more weight on the, the, the blinding. You can see that if there are some RCT or some intervention study that you cannot do the double blind. For example, if you compare the exercise, effect of exercise on uh, cardiovascular risk, so you randomize one group of people to do exercise, the other group not doing exercise, you cannot do that and buy, right? So you can see that based on the data score, if you cannot do that and buy, your score, you will lose two points. 
So you will not get more than three score out of five. So it gives more weight to uh, a double bind. In fact, in some intervention study, you cannot really do double bind. And it, it does, it, uh, you shouldn't give more weight on that. And okay. So these are ex a critique of the JADA score. So people thought that it's not, uh, it's short, it's easy to, to perform because it's only five, uh, okay, it's only five point and it has a clear cut that if you've got three or more score, it means that high quality, but you can see that uh, people really think that a data score is not good because it's keep more weight on the quality of reporting than the actual methodological quality. So I will move on and talking about another instrument that you use to assess the the quality of the RCT. This is also very popular, the Cochrane risk of uh, bias two. This is for to assess the RCT. It contains seven specific domains. The first domain is talking about the random sequence generation. The second domain is like a location consuming. The third is like binding of participant and personnel. And then um, the force is a binding of outcome assessment. The force is incomplete outcome data, selective reporting, and utter bias. So there are seven specific domains, and in each domain, you can see that uh, you can the response can be low risk of bias. You got green sign, and high risk of bias. You got like red sign. You got minus. An unclear list of bias is like yellow sign, it's like a traffic light sign. So this slide show how they evaluate each study according to the seven specific domain of the clock and risk of bias too. So let me talk a bit about each criteria or each domain. The first domain talking about the random sequence generation. So basically it's talking about was the allocation con uh, sequence adequately generated? Talking about how you generate the random randomization schedule. Like you do it by computer generating, you to toss a coin or something like that. And the second domain talking about allocation consuming. Once you generate the sequence, how you conceal your sequence, like you putting in the opaque envelope and seal it or you use like a uh, computer you use like the center base when you call in and then the center tell you the the sequence generation this is talking about uh, random sequence generation and then uh, the third talking about the 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 outcome assessment the blinding of our the binding of our uh, the blinding of intervention, whether you do double bind or not, and then the third one talking about uh, the second one talking about binding of participant and personnel, whether the doctor and the patient know which drug or which intervention that they were on or not, and the third one talk the fourth one talking about the blinding of outcome assessment, whether the people who assess the outcome know or not that this person are in the intervention group or the control groups. And then the fifth domain talking about the incomplete outcome data. So it will describe how many people drop out on from the study. You have to report the number and the reason. If there are many people drop out from a study, this means that this is highly sub-biased though. And the sixth domain talking about the selective reporting. Suppose that you mentioned that you interested in five outcomes. And then when you report, you report the outcome based on the five outcome. You report all five outcome that you state at the beginning or not. Or at the beginning, your objective, you interested in five outcome, but you report only four outcome. This is mean selective reporting. And if you have selective reporting, you have high risk of bias. 
And the seventh domain or the last domain you focus on are the sources of bias. So it's uh, concerning about other bias that not beside the, the previous six bias. And this item have, um, there are more, uh, a lot of questions about this, the other source of bias domain. When you're talking about the other source of bias, many people thought of think differently about what it means by other sources of bias. The hint is that you should focus on the mechanism that lead to the bias rather than the thing that really affect the quality of the studies. These are example of the quality indicator. It means that this thing are related to the quality, not the bias. And these are not, should not be reported as the other source of bias. For example, they didn't calculate the sample size or they use small sample size. This is not bias. This is the quality of a study. Or the ethical criteria, the study didn't apply for the ethical approval. So this is not bias. It, it has not the bias, but the quality of the study. So if the study didn't report the sample size or have small sample size or didn't follow the ethical approval or people didn't, didn't talking about how people give informed consent, these are related to the quality of the study. It should not be a uh, thing as an other source of bias. On the other hand, these are examples of other source of bias. When you randomize and the baseline characteristic of the group that you compare are imbalanced. This, even though you randomize, they are not comparable at the baseline. These are examples of other source of bias. Or when they conduct a study, there are any deviations from the study protocol. They not follow the protocol that they written. They said that they will do like this, but they do it the other way. They said that they will give the intervention to the participant and then they will measure the outcome on day one, week six or something like that. But they do something different from the, the way they report in the protocol. These are examples of other sources of bias. And when you use the instruments that are not sensitive for a specific outcome, these are another example of other source of bias as well. Or uh, they use inappropriate eligibility criteria. These are also examples of other sources, other sources of bias. And unlike the data uh, score that you, I mentioned that for data that it ranged from zero to five, and if you got at least three, you it means that you have high quality. But for um, the Cochrane uh, risk of bias too, it's not like that. You will not calculate the total score. Your response will be for each domain will be high risk, low risk, or unclear risk of bias. And for each individual study, we will say that this individual study have low risk of bias if they have low risk of bias for all domains. But we will say it, we will say that there is some concern for this study if there is unclear risk of bias for one or more key study, but not to be at high risk of bias in any domain. This is some concern. But you said that uh, they have a high risk of bias when you have one or more domain that you have high risk of uh, uh, biases. And this is for each individual study. And what is mean by when you do the overall across the study, you can based on this criteria as well, based on like common detail. If when you compare or suppose you have five individual study in this systematic review, all five study is defined as low risk of bias. So across study mean that uh, your systematic review consists of like low risk of bias studies, something like that. But there is no magic cutoff point. There is no magic word that how many points you will not calculate the total score. You will not have the cutoff. What is mean by the high quality? You have to use the judgment for 
each each individual study and each criteria and each domain, how that will lead to the biases. And before I talking about how you summarize the result in the systematic review, let me remind you about the differences between systematic review and meta-analysis. Systematic review basically is a summary of the medical literature, but not just a summary. You, when you do a systematic review, you have to use explicit method. You have to specify how you search the data, how you, what is your eligibility criteria, how you select the study, how you combine the study. You have to use the explicit method. And it's based on through literature search. You have to do comprehensive search. And then you have to um, assess a, start, uh, a quality of each individual study. And then you synthesize the literature. This is mean by the systematic review. When you synthesize the literature, you can use either statistical technique to combine the data from, from each study. This is called meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is the way when you do, when you summarize data in the quantitative way, you combine the data together. Uh, the systematic review may or may not include meta-analysis. Suppose you search all the literature, you identify eligibility criteria, you're doing the study quality assessment, and then you just de describe the study. You summarize the study in a descriptive way. This is like systematic review already. But if you combine the result of each individual study using a statistical technique, this is mean by meta-analysis. So this is example of the meta-analysis. This is a quantitative approach when you're combining the results of the previous research. And the good part of doing meta-analysis is that you can arrive at the conclusion about the body of research. You combine the result to get a conclusion. This is the meta-analysis. And this picture shows the relationship between literature review systematic review and meta-analysis. The blue uh, one shows the literature review. It can be narrative review or other review. You just summarize the article. This is literature review. And here, the dark blue one stands for a systematic review. Systematic review is a subset of the literature review. In that, you're doing the literature review systematically. It means that you search you do comprehensive search. You have a, a clear eligibility criteria. You assess the quality of each study before you summarize them. So this is the subset of literature review we call systematic review. And once you do systematic review, and then you combine the result using a quant, uh, using a, a, a um a statistical technique. You combine the result, it means that you're doing a meta-analysis. So the gray one is a, a meta-analysis based on the systematic review. Once you're doing the systematic review and then you combine the result uh, using a statistical technique, this is the meta-analysis after the systematic review, which is the best one. And you can see the white one, which is the meta-analysis. You can do the white area here represent when you're doing the meta-analysis, but not based on the systematic review because meta-analysis is only the statistical technique when you combine the result. For example, if you're doing a systematic review, you might identify 10 articles that should be included in your review. And then you combine all 10 articles here and doing a meta-analysis, this will fall into the gray area. But if you didn't doing the systematic review, you will just find any study and you didn't do it systematically. So you instead of identify 10 studies to be included in your meta-analysis, you can identify only seven studies here because you, do it, you didn't do the systematic review. You just identify only seven study, and then you combine the result of the seven study here. It means that you conduct a meta-analysis. 
but not based on the systematic review. So this is in Y area and this is not good. The best thing is you're doing the systematic review first and then you combine the result using meta-analysis. So it will be in the gray area. So now you know the difference between systematic review and meta-analysis. So if you're doing the uh, systematic review and then when you summarize the result, you didn't combine the result, you just describe, it will be the uh, it will be the descriptive synthesis. But if you combine the result, it will be like a meta-analysis. So let me talking about when you uh, doing the descriptive synthesis. So you didn't do the meta-analysis, you just describe the study that you included from the systematic review. So basically you describe or study that are included in your review. For example, you summarize the study by intervention, by comparison, by patient group, by study design, and by outcome. And then you highlight similarity and difference and try to identify the patterns. And you can see that the pattern may also exist based on different population feature. For example, Drug A might work well in adult, but not in children. Or pattern might exist uh, based on the intervention characteristic. If you use high dose, it can like prevent CSD, but if you use low dose, it tend to be not effective. Or pattern can be exist based on the duration of treatment. For example, long-term, like more than one year seem to be effective. Why short term less than one year, the intervention will not be effective, something like that. You try to summarize a study by intervention, by comparison, by population, and try to identify the pattern like this, or even try to identify the result based on a study design. For example, RCT found no effects. Why a low quality study like Quasi RCT identify that these drugs are effective. So you try to find the heterogeneity or like the different across each individual studies. These are example of uh, um, this are example of descriptive synthesis. So these are the way you describe if you're doing the systematic review, but not meta analysis. These are examples of how you do descriptive synthesis in the meta in the systematic review. You describe the study and try to identify the pattern. For example, it said that uh, this is a systematic review on effectiveness of vitamin C on common code. They said that in this review, we identify seven trials which conduct in military personnel. Three trials conduct in students two trials conduct in marathon runner. So they describe a study by a participant, and then they describe based on a study design. Eight of these, eight of these trials are double by and placebo control, and seven are randomized. And then they describe the pattern of the outcome. They said that five small trials found statistical significant 45% to 91% reduction in common core incident in the vitamin C groups. And then they try to find a pattern that this try were shot and the participants were under heavy exertion during the try. And then they describe three other try found significant uh, 80 to 100% reduction in the in incident of pneumonia in vitamin C groups something like that. So they describe how they find in the included study. They didn't combine the result, right? You can see that they identify seven study in military personnel, three in, stud in student and two in marathon learner. So the total they identify is 12, 12 study, right? Based on 12 study, five study found that vitamin C can reduce common cold. So it means that seven studies found that vitamin C cannot reduce common cold. So 
this is the way we do uh, descriptive synthesis. You not combine the result. You have to well study. Five said that vitamin C can uh, reduce incidence of common cold by 45 to 81 percent. And the other seven said that it cannot reduce, uh, in, it has no effect on the incidence of common cold. So you still have controversy, right? So this is example of how you do descriptive synthesis. You describe the pattern like this, but you didn't combine the result. These are another way of doing the analysis. This is example of when you combine the result using meta-analysis. They said that they identify, uh, this is semantic review, they identify 29 study. And then based on 29 study, they pull the re relative risk from the 29 study. And the relative risk uh, is like 0 0.96 and 95% confident interval is 0 0.92 to 1, which is not significant because the 95% confident interval include 1. So it means that based on this meta-analysis of 29 trial, the vitamin C cannot reduce common code. So this is the way you do uh, quantitatively, not only descriptive synthesis. So this is example of how you do meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is like example of quantitative synthesis. When you're doing the meta-analysis, you have to consider the types of outcome. Types of the outcome that you want to combine can be dichotomous, for example, like relative risk, odd ratio, hazard ratio, or least difference. And the outcome can also be continuous, like mean difference or standard type mean difference. And when you're doing the quantitative synthesis, there are many software that you can use. Um, for example, Refman, which is Refman uh, software, which is developed by the Kotkin group. This is free and you can, uh, easy to use, you can feel free to download from the website. And there's also a manual of how uh, you use the, the, the software as well. So it is quite easy to use. Or if you want to do more sophisticated uh, uh, technique, you can use data or something like that. And when you do meta-analysis or quantitative synthesis, there are two types of model that you can use, like fixed effect model and random effect models. And fixed effect model will use when there is no heterogeneity. Heterogeneity means uh, when there is a heterogeneity, means there is a different across individual study. This is mean the heterogeneity. And when you do the quantitative uh, synthesis or meta-analysis, the result that you will get will be the result from meta-analysis, which is present in terms of forest plot. These are examples of forest plot that you uh, will get when you do a quantitative synthesis. Basically, each slide will represent each individual study. So based on this, you want to combine the result from for individual study. And the last one here, which is like the diamond, this is the pool result. Okay. I won't go into detail now because I have uh, time limited. Just uh, let you know that this is like a forest plot, which is the way you uh, uh, report the quantitative analysis like this. And then let's move on to the last topic how to report the systematic rule and meta-analysis. As Ajahn Arkan already mentioned previously, when you conduct a systematic rule or meta-analysis and what you want to get published or you want to write up the report, you have to follow the PRISMA guideline. The PRISMA stands for preferred reporting items for systematic rule and meta-analysis. The aim of the PRISMA statement is to help the authors to improve the way you report. The systematic review. And the PRISMA statement consists of 27 item checklists and the four phase flow diagram in which Ajahn Aton have already shown to you. And PRISMA is the way you report the uh, systematic review and meta analysis. There is another checklist called MOS. MOS is also uh, a reporting checklist for systematic review and meta analysis of observational study. Uh, this slide shows 
the example of prisma flow chart in which Ajahn Athan already mentioned that you have four steps. The first step is identification. You have to say that how many record you identify from each database. And once you remove the duplicate, how many study left to be screened? And once into the screen, how many records screen were screened and how many records were excluded? And then how many full text articles were assessed for eligibility? And how many were excluded with the reason? And then how many studies were included in the qualitative synthesis? And how many were included in the quantitative synthesis or meta-analysis? This is the example of Prisma flow diagram. So if you're doing the meta uh, systematic review and meta-analysis, you must include the flow chart like this. And then you have to go uh, complete each checklist. For example, the first one, your title. You should, the title of your review should mention that this is systematic review or meta-analysis. And you also have in your abstract, what you have to identify in your abstract, you have to report background, objective, data sources, study eligibility criteria, participant intervention, how you assess the quality or something like that. And you also have to say about the systematic review registration number. Okay, I will talk about what is mean by systematic review registration number. Basically, before you conduct a systematic review, you have to register your study with the PROSPERO. PROSPERO means International Prospective Register of Systematic Review. It was launched in 2011 to increase the transparency of systematic review, of the uh, yeah, systematic review. It is produced by the Center for Review and Dissemination at the University of York. So once you write up your protocol about the systematic review, you have to check with, her, with the prosper or with the other people already conduct the systematic review similar to your that the one that you are going to conduct or not. If not, you have to register your study. And when you register your study at the Prospero, there are 22 mandatory items that you need to fill in and 18 optional items. The item that you need to fill in uh, included the title, and the anticipate date of start, the method of how you're conducting the uh, systematic review and other information. And then it's like you have to write up the protocol and then register and put all the detail on the Prospero. And also it provides the user with the information on the status of your systematic review, that it is now ongoing or you already completed but not published or you you completed and you published so if you register your study you finish it and then you publish you have to go to the prospero and then update your information or something like that so once you register at the prospero you will get a registration number in which you need to put in the abstract and these are um, example of the prisma checklist uh, for example, in each method, what are the things that you need to describe and at what page that you describe it? For example, search, uh, did you present full electronic search strategy for at least one database or including any remit use such that it could be repeated? Or in the study selection, you have to state the process of selecting studies, the screening eligibility included in the study review or something like that. So these are the checklists that you have to look carefully and then you have to, to write down when you write up the report of the, uh, of the systematic review. Okay, these are, each section will tell you what are the things that you have to write. So it is good idea that you read the Prisma first before you developing your own protocol. Okay, these are the Prisma checklists again. So I think uh, that is it for my sections. Okay. okay.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Montarat, for the nice presentation. Actually, it is very uh, complete uh, from systematic review to meta analysis and to the writing the report. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's we move to discussion session. Uh, is it Achar Aton is there? Hello, Achan Aton. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, our panelists will uh, answer the question in Q&A box uh, live. Yeah. Yep. I can uh, manage it. Uh, maybe we can start from Achan Aton and give Achan more for take a rest for a while. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Achan Aton, there is a question from Nora Uhamka, Jakarta. Uh, I think similar question will be uh, is uh, was asked by Bu Ana from Gajah Mada. Uh, they asked about uh, how many databases or sources uh, to conduct systematic review. Achan Arto mentioned that uh, it must be more than one database. But in case for, for example, in some uh, some university, maybe in our university, uh, it is uh, the access is limited. Uh, can we use a national database for, for example, national journals? for systematic review. And then uh, it is also a question from, can we use gray literature, Ajan? For example, dissertation, uh, thesis, something like that in maybe in Bahasa, Bahasa Indonesia or in a non-English language. Okay, Ajan, that's yes, uh, the yes. first question. Yes, so it's up to the, the application of the result. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, louder, louder. Oh, okay, better now. Yeah. It's okay, good. I think uh, <clears throat> it's up to the application of the result of the review and the user. For example, uh, if you want to review and pro uh, provide the result to the national committee uh, to make decision to accept the new duck um, or not, okay, it's quite serious. So in that case, you cannot say that I have limitation to access some database, so that I don't include. So you have to pay the money, you have to invest the money to access, to include, okay. But uh, if you just want to know the situation of the research uh, for the master thesis, so it might not so serious because uh, you can repeat the previous study at the master level, okay. But uh, for the PhD, it's more serious that you should not repeat the previous study. Okay, you have to more serious to include more database. And also another uh, <clears throat> point is that if you want to publish, okay, I think only PubMed is not acceptable uh, for the journal to accept. Okay, should be more than that. And I showed you already that it PubMed not, uh, uh, not cover all papers. Okay, and in case, <clears throat> at a student, so in up to the university policy, if the university cannot provide the facility to, to subscribe more database, so then students have only PubMed and then they produce the report, only PubMed, and you said, no, not acceptable. This is a problem. So if the university want the higher quality of the review, okay, you need to invest more money for the student. Okay, so it's not the it's not the yes or no, but it's up to the application of the result and how serious of the result that you are going to have. Okay, okay Achan, uh, related to that question, Putu Dian, uh, our Mahidon alumni, I think, yeah, uh, also asked about the how to maintain the quality of systematic review. Uh, but uh, we only have access, uh, for example, PubMed on and Google Scholar. Even Scopus, uh, they cannot access because it is paid database. How about that, Ajahn? So I think the same question same, about yeah. the database, mm -hmm. the same. Yeah. yeah. And also, the... and, yes, and so also the gray literature or the digital mm. database. If you want to, to know the, the study in your country only, 
the situation of the research in your country how how as one of academics okay you may focus on the the the, the local database so it up mm -hmm. to applic application mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. okay Ajahn. another question is about the it is a need to apply ethics document uh, to the ethical, ethical committee before we submit the systematic review. Uh, I, never, I never apply. I, mm. I, I never apply. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that it is not, it not related to the human. Not related. Yeah, I yes. think yes. I think so. Uh, and students, our students also ask about the bibliometric analysis. Uh, maybe it is a... Uh, have you uh, read about that? What I is the difference between systematic review and bibliometric analysis, Ajahn? I never known that, though, but on my knowledge, it's not the mm -hmm. same, but it might have some similarity, but I don't mm -hmm. know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think so, because a bibliometric is, is like a, to capture what is what is the higher interest in topic, in the topic, and the high 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 edge index of uh, authors, and uh, uh, for example, the country uh, who more publish uh, paper in that field, something like that. I think bibliometric mm. analysis. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, for Achan Arthur uh, from Mega Putra. Uh, how can we conclude if our analysis so significant five four in subgroup analysis? Uh, because a subgroup analysis is such a limiting with the some criteria. How is uh, can be uh, capture the real Im implementation? Ajahn, how do you think? I, I forward this to Ajahn Montalat. Okay, I think it is, uh, it is uh, appropriate to Ajahn Montalat uh, yes, yes. for the subgroup analysis. Yes. Okay, I think you will do subgroup analysis when you thought that there, there is a heterogeneity or the result is different by the subgroup. So you will do the subgroup analysis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Ajahn Wan. I think uh, the question for Ajahn Arton, uh, you may add uh, some response, Ajahn, later on. Uh, many questions also for Ajahn Mon. Uh, for example, yeah, I can uh, just uh, from Galo uh, about the selecting uh, journals, uh, maybe journal or paper. Is there any specifics uh, for? Uh, specific is there any specific method for specific types of clinical question Ajahn? Uh, what is it? I think when you selecting the study you should uh, set up the, the criteria in, in PICO format P stands yeah. for patient or participant mm -hmm. I intervention comparator and outcome right. and this PICO that you uh, develop it should match with your objective of the study. So you develop the peak code and then you uh, uh, develop an eligibility criteria based on the peak code and then you're selecting the studies. Okay. Because it's the simple way to frame the question, Ajahn, yeah? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, one more, I think from Nia, Ajahn, Arton. Uh, it seems like PubMed has been upgraded that there is no mesh in search area except in advanced section. Uh, have you experienced with that, Ajahn Arton? Yes, it's still available, but uh, it's not the same as the previous one. You okay. see that previous one is easier, but uh, this is you have to submit to another window and then exit to the mesh database. Okay. okay. It's still available, but you can explore. Yeah, uh -huh. it's still available yeah, in the advanced uh, menu. Uh, for Achan Montarat, uh, someone also asked about the maybe related to the quality of study. It is necessary to consider high impact factor of studies. I, I think uh, maybe high no. impact factor of journal. <laughs> yeah. no, 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 any instrument that consider the impact. The yeah, impact. no, any instrument. I think Jadat, um, uh, Kohren, and yeah. The others. Yeah, Dr. Susi, can I? I, yeah. I go back to the previous uh, question that 
some people asking about how you do when you have limit access to the database, like yeah. only PubMed that will like affect the quality of meta. You are systematically. Yeah. I think you can do it a collaboration with us. We have oh. MOU, and then you can do a collaboration with Mahido, yeah. and we can doing together like Ajahn wow. Thon. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I think so, Ajahn, yeah. huh? because yeah. uh, I also have experience. We can access many papers mm. from the overseas, uh, and we can also, uh, yeah, uh, develop uh, from protocols uh, until we publish the systematic review, Ajahn. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, another question is uh, from Krishna from Bali. There was a very nice topic. I have question. When we do a study quality assessment, but uh, some study does not explain the detail of methods, how to get generate the randomization, but they provide a link in detail protocol of randomization, maybe in another uh, papers, yeah, separately from their articles. How we judge uh, the study quality, Ajahn? You have to follow the link and read it. Mm. So <laughs> we, it, can, it, we can we um, can make uh, the mark that it is good quality, something like that, Ajahn? You, you have to go, suppose it said that the detail is in the supplement, uh, mm -hmm. detail and follow the link and then you follow the link and read and then assess the quality. Or uh, sometimes you can write to the author as well. Yeah, okay. Thanks uh, for Ajahn's suggestion. From the STA Resource Center, um, Mr. Yugo Shkuraf, uh, uh, he asked about, is it mandatory to register systematic review in Prospero? Because it is uh, many fill, uh, many form must be filled. If someone doing little similar study, can we do that on the that topic or some tips, practical tips uh, to do the systematic review in the topic, Ajahn? Uh, basically, it's not say it's not explicitly say that you need to register to the Prospero, but but once you want to get published, many articles require you that you register your study or not. So it's like implicit, not explicit. Yeah. But many people, uh, they said that you have to wait quite long for yeah. the Prospero registration or something yeah. like that. But but I think it's the most popular one. You you need still yeah. need to do it. And yeah, I also have experience with uh, submitting the protocol in Prospero, mm -hmm. but I also with the team uh, still run the search strategy and then while we, we wait for the approval uh, from mm -hmm. Prospero, is it a good way or not? <laughs> I think you, yeah, this is the thing that people critique that they need to wait so long until they mm. can register. I think you can, you can do, you can check by yourself if it's mm. no existing systematic review, you can like do it in parallel and hopefully that no one already registered the study in the Prospero though. And let, go back to the your guest question, if someone already did, the systematic review or they already mm -hmm. registered at the Prospero whether you can do it or not. So I'm um, is it's like they already register and it's it's not really that you cannot do but it might you might you might need to read that protocol whether you can do it differently or not or there is still a gap of knowledge that you yeah. can do it different way or not. So read it carefully. And, and also if you, they already register and you keep in mind that they might finish before you. So if you do exactly yeah. the same thing and you cannot get published because you, they already did and get published. Yeah, it can, we can uh, like uh, reframing the, mm. the scope or maybe the different uh, perspective from the published uh, systematic review. Mm -hmm. It is a uh, many interesting question from uh, Bandung, Sindra. Is there any specific number of journal when we do piloting the data extraction form? And uh, what time is the, the good uh, 
time ya yeah. uh, I mean we have to pilot in timely manner in which uh, period Ajan? basically there is no number that how many study that you need to pilot your data extraction but I think you can do like five to ten to see that the coding that you identify or the the variable that you identify are matched well with the study or not or something like that but there is no no exact number how many you should pilot if you read and you found that our uh, study are quite similar and this variable are enough that should be okay or something like that. okay yeah another question uh but the meta analysis i think how many minimum extracted data i mean maybe uh, individual studies to conduct meta analysis maybe is it okay if we only have two studies Ajan, for yes, conduct at least two <laughs> at least two at yeah least two. i think so <laughs> yeah uh, what about in systematic review descriptive analysis Ajan? is there any minimum of uh, articles no there is no minimum so no minimum. it depends on because you try to find how many people uh, what are the existing evidence in in this world so there is no minimum that how many you identify okay uh yeah i think uh Question from Andy Lenny: How to report systematic review for qualitative research? Uh, can we do the same way with the uh, our explanation today, or we have another way to present in qualitative research, Ajan? Oh, I'm so sorry. This is uh, I have limited knowledge about the systematic review of qualitative. This is another way of doing this. It's like another field. I think there are yeah. different methods of doing the systematic review of the qualitative studies. So okay. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, maybe we, we can learn from the scooping mm. review or narrative review for the qualitative research. And I think for... Yeah, try to make a theme and category, something like that. Maybe uh, we can learn uh, more with the next webinar. I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I think systematic review and meta analysis can be done for other fields other than pharmacy field, right, Ajan? What about the, for example, pharmaceutical science uh, field? in pharmacology, in uh, another field of health science or pharmacy practice science field, Ajahn? Yes, I think they can do in pharmacology when I think in pharmacology, the, they're not conducting a study in human. I think they conduct a study in, in rat, in mice and doing the pharmacokinetics or something like that. And they can, I think they can do it. Well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a question from Henning, and this it is uh, appropriate for Ajahn Arton. If we are going to do systematic review and there is a similar systematic review in the, maybe in the past two years, it is okay we do systematic review on that topic? I mean the updated one? Uh, yeah, Ajahn. Sorry. Yeah, okay. okay. Sorry. So if you conduct a preliminary research in during the past two years after the previous one, and you got a lot of papers, okay, and in addition to the consider the quality of the previous review, okay, if the previous review is very good, already really good, and uh, in the past few years, just few papers, mm. Mm. Uh, so you don't need to repeat, okay, you just uh, list some but that means you can, if you want to get the result, you can read uh, the previous and additional papers and to know the result. Uh, you okay. cannot publish, mm, I think. Okay. And, uh, another question. Uh, 
about the statistical method in the meta analysis, it is for Achan Montarat. Maybe um, is there any option of uh, to do? Uh, well, it is uh, can be done in Excel or another software or types of methods, Achan specific methods. Mm, I I don't think it can be done in Excel. Mm -hmm. I, as far as I know, mm -hmm. you can use Leftman as I recommend. It is easy to use. You can use Data as well. Data yeah. or Leftman. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This. Oh, this is a nice question from uh, Aji Purwokerto. Yeah. Achan Mon, Achan Arton, I think have been there in Purwokerto. Uh, how we assess the study quality assessment for the observational studies uh, uh, for score, for example, stroke checklist, uh, can we use it uh, and how to score it? Can Achan Arton or Achan Mon, yeah? Yeah, you can use when you assess uh, a study quality of uh, observational study, you can use new Castle Ottawa scale, uh -huh. NOS, or you can Ottawa. use SIGN yeah. -I or something like that. Or Robbins, there are these Robins are as well. uh, inst instrument to assess the quality of observational study. Mm -hmm. But STROBE is the, med, uh, is the guideline of how you report the observational mm -hmm. study. It's mm -hmm. like the consort statement in RCT, the way yeah. you report, but not the, the quality assessment. Okay. Okay, so it is suggested to use Robin's uh, tools, Ajahn. Robin's or uh, uh, New, Newcastle, Ottawa. Newcastle, or Ottawa, yeah. It's okay. IT in. Uh -huh. uh, interesting question for Pakistan. Uh, Shah Faisal. As about can we search Google Scholar for literature search? They mean maybe Google Scholar only. Yeah, uh, a lot of uh, retrieve study got about more than thirty thousand. How to do with that? To deal with that, Ajan? Can we like uh, just uh, refocusing the key uh, search term or? other ones if we got uh, around 30,000 mm -hmm. <laughs> articles. Okay, uh, there are two issues. Uh, the first one is a too broad search term or too broad uh, research review question, okay, that you have to narrow to find a more specific, okay. Another issue is uh, the, the period of the publication, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it's up to the, the, the type of the research. For example, if you want to review the behavior of teenagers, mm -hmm, to know the behavior of teenagers, you don't need to back up to like a 40, 50 years ago because uh, it's not useful to know what teenager in 40, 50 years ago. So we just want to know in not like a 10 years yeah. ago, that enough because uh, we want to know at the input to do something to improve the problem, to solve the problem. So it's up to the uh, the benefit, the application of the result as yeah. well. So we can we can limit by year, ten years. That's the way to reduce the numbers. Okay, limit the years. Uh, also, this question for Maria: the the maybe the duration period of study maybe can be limited to uh, reduce the number of uh, screen articles. Okay, I think all question has been answered uh, one more each uh, should each systematic review should have for plot i think achan montarat already uh, explained that uh, is for plot or meta analysis result uh, result is uh, on a subset of a uh, systematic review with the quantitative uh, analysis and the systematic review or literature review will not have forest plot, right, Ajahn? To repeat question again. Uh, some systematic review did not uh, use forest plot. 
Uh, is it uh, forest plot is for meta analysis, right, Ajan? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That the last question, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. We we come to the the end of session. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> the patience of all speakers. Uh, for wrapping up, uh, let me summarize that uh, for. Systematic review, we can done with the systematical, systematically step from framing the question with PICO or other, other framework, identifying relevant studies using searching strategies as Ajan Arton mentioned, and assessing study quality. Ajan more already explained about the, uh, the way to assess quality of each study and uh, summarizing evidence using data extraction and must be done independently by uh, authors uh, and must be piloted and uh, writing the report. I think this is also the, the biggest challenge for us to write the report following Prisma, Prisma guideline. Okay, we highly appreciate to all speakers, uh, Professor Arthur, Professor Montarat. Uh, yeah, really uh, happy to have you today. Yeah, and all organizing committee or uh, participants, we have uh, more than 500 participants and more in the YouTube, YouTube streaming. Uh, and yeah, we hope uh, we can collaborate to to do systematic review in the next future. <laughs> and let me close this event. Wish you all the best, uh, Achan, and a greeting uh, from us to all uh, teacher in uh, Mahidol University. Stay healthy and keep on learning. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you okay, so for inviting we, us. Yeah, we have you. a photo session. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just hi, do we? We are waiting <laughs> for other the others uh, panelists and the other teams. <laughs> we have Pidwi, uh, Prof Agung, uh, Pak Satibi. <laughs> Very much, Ampun. yeah, Thank Doctor. You, uh, Prof. Triana, yeah. our vice dean in Dr. academics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Doctor Endang of Pido University. <laughs> <laughs> in the background. Yeah, yeah, very nice background. Thank you. I cannot <laughs> show my okay. picture. Oh yeah, okay. Please unmute my uh, video. Let's have uh, our admin, uh, Bu That's Endang, Pun Ampon, Asatibi. Ya, Bu Triana, Bu Endang. Ya, yeah. yeah, halo. But I cannot unmute my uh, video, uh, my camera. <laughs> Bu Endang, ya, yeah. please. Oke, okay. ya, yeah. oke. Okay, yeah. Oke, okay, Bu Triana. Uh, Mbak Saras, okay. please turn on your video camera. Mbak <laughs> Saras, please come. Yeah. My thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. I will take screenshot. Yeah. Screenshot. Yeah. One, two, three. Yes. All of us, Pak Agung. Huh? <laughs> Don't only you. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I will uh, take all of uh, pictures. Yeah, one, two, three. Okay. Please, yeah. uh, perhaps Bu Susi or Bu Dwi also take a screenshot. So yeah, we have sure. uh, many pictures many... of us. Yeah. <laughs> Find the new way to take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> we love uh, take picture, Ajan. <laughs> okay, finish. Virtual meeting. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. all. Thank you very much. Thank Dr. you too. And Dr. Yeah. Montarat. Thank you too. Okay. Thank you. Hope to see you again, Aja. Bye. 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 Stay safe. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, masih teh udah punya bagus.
Okay. Thank you very much. Enggak, sudah selesai.